Hi, I'm Emily Freeman. I'm thrilled to be here with you all. I'm the author of DevOps for Dummies and the co-curator of 97 Things Every Cloud Engineer Should Know. I want to share with you kind of a wild idea, <laughs> a complete reimagining of the SDLC. And I want to be clear before I even start, I want your feedback. If you have ideas around this or thoughts, you can always find me on Twitter at Editing Emily. Most of my work centers around DevOps, and I really can't overstate the sheer impact that DevOps has had on the industry. In many ways, it built the foundation, uh, built on the foundation of Agile to become a default, a standard we all reach for in our everyday work. Now, when DevOps surfaced as an idea in 2008, the tech industry was in a wildly different place. AWS was an in infancy offering only a handful of services. Azure and GCP didn't exist yet, at least not publicly. The majority of companies maintained their own infrastructure. Developers wrote code and relied on sysadmins to deploy new code at scheduled intervals. Container technology hadn't been invented and applications adhered to a monolithic architecture. Databases were almost always relational. Everything from the system to the people was centralized. Now our current ecosystem couldn't be more different and all that changed in a little over a decade. Sometimes, honestly, I think it's amazing we're still standing and more than surviving, we are thriving. Now, don't get me wrong, software is hard. It always will be, but we continue to find novel solutions to consistently difficult, persistent problems. Some of these end up being a rebranding of old ideas, but others are a unique and clever take to abstracting complexity or automating toil, perhaps most important, rethinking, even challenging the premises we have accepted as canon for years, if not decades. In the years since DevOps attempted to answer the critical conflict between developers and operations engineers, DevOps has become a catch-all term. And there have been a number of derivative works. DevOps has come to mean 5,000 different things to 5,000 different people. For some, it's simply CI, CD. For others, it's deploying code faster. For others, still, it's organizational. They've added a platform team or a questionably named DevOps team. Maybe they've even created an engineering structure that focuses on a separation of concerns, leaving feature teams to manage the development, deployment, and security, as well as maintenance of their siloed services. Whatever the interpretation, what's important is there isn't a universally accepted standard of what DevOps is or what it looks like in execution. It's a philosophy more than anything else, a framework that people can utilize and configure, even customize their specific circumstances to modern development practices. The one characteristic of DevOps that I think we can all agree on is that it attempted to capture the challenges of the entire software development process from start to finish. None of the derivative works have been that ambitious. They tend to focus only on a segment of software delivery. It's that broad umbrella, that holistic view that I think we need to breathe life into once again. Beyond the interpretations or misinterpretations, the imitations or spinoffs of DevOps, DevSecOps was the first, of course, adding the ever important security to the initial idea. And from there, well, came what I lovingly call the blank ops, ML ops, Git ops, AI ops, biz dev ops, data ops. I know naming is hard, but we are better than this, y'all. <laughs> now I'm being glib. I fundamentally believe that DevOps has changed our industry 
for the better. It is a nearly globally adopted solution. We work more as teams. We've reduced silos. We think systemically. We've sometimes embraced failure. And we're much better communicators across the full process of delivering software. The challenge we face is that DevOps is an increasingly outmoded solution to a previous problem. Developers now face cultural and technical challenges far greater than how to more quickly deploy a monolithic application. Cloud native is the future, the next collection of default development decisions. And it's one that DevOps can't absorb in its current form. I believe the era of DevOps is waning. And in this moment, as the sun sets on DevOps, we have a unique opportunity to rethink, rebuild, even replatform. But big shifts are hard and they deserve a lot of thought. When I first decided to really think about this, to sit with what could be next for DevOps or even replace it. I didn't know if I would end up building on the foundation and ad of Agile and DevOps, capping it off like a three-layered pyramid or burning everything to the ground and starting as a phoenix, building anew from ash. Turns out, as with most creative work, it's a little bit of both. Now, there's a balance here. The technology adoption life cycle was created by researchers Beale and Bolin in 1957. And a version of it you've probably seen was popularized by Jeffrey Moore in his book, Crossing the Chasm. It discusses how different groups of people adopt new technology at various times. Innovators and early adopters are the first to transition, whereas late adopters are a little slower. The truth is companies and organizations, even people are still adopting and implementing DevOps because it is valuable. But I don't want to wait until the very last person decides to get on the DevOps train to start thinking about what's next. Continuous improvement doesn't just apply to our systems, it applies to us too. We know that to stay relevant, honestly, even employed in tech, we have to constantly learn new skills, new tools, and understand new frameworks. That's part of the job. And that same learning culture applies to how we think about our people systems as much as it does our software. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not completely certain what the next decade of tech is going to look like. And I can't write this story alone. I need you. But I have some ideas that I think can get the conversation started. I believe to build on what was, we have to throw away assumptions the ones we've taken for granted all this time, in order to move forward, we must first step back. The software or systems development life cycle, what we call the SDLC, has been around since the 1960s. And it's remained more or less the same since before color television and the touch-tone phone. Over the last 60 years, We've made tweaks and slight adjustments. We've massaged it, rebranded it a little, but the SDLC is still very much there. The stages and steps are always a little bit different. And with Agile and DevOps, we sort of bent it into a circle and then an infinity loop. We added pretty colors. <laughs> but across all use cases, the SDLC has become a ubiquitous assumption. We don't even think about it anymore. It just is. Universally adopted constructs like the SDLC have a unspoken permanence. They feel as if they have always been and always will be. I think the impact of that is even more potent if you were born after the construct was popularized. Nearly everything around us 
is a construct, a model, an artifact of a human idea. The chair you're sitting in, the desk you work at, the mug from which you drink coffee or other beverages, <laughs> buildings, toilets, plumbing, roads, cars, art, computers, everything. And beyond all the modern inventions that make our lives more convenient, there are perhaps more substantial examples. Have you ever thought about why the alphabet is ordered the way it is? Why is A first and not K? Why do we use a base 10 counting system and not 10, why 10 distinct digits and not two or 12 or 60? It turns out that the culture in which we learn and live and create has incredible impact on how we innovate. Zero was a placeholder, a way of denoting value in a positional number system long before it was a number itself. To the best of our knowledge, zero was defined by a num as a number by uh, Brahmagupta, a Hindu mathematician and astronomer in 628 CE. In Sanskrit, zero is called shunya, and scholars believe this was developed out of the philosophy of emptiness called shunyata. The invention of zero as a number was born out of the cultural and philosophical norms of India at the time. Culture, the environment in which people operate, determines how the same people think and solve problems. India developed a rich environment of philosophical thinking, which enabled its citizens to think differently and encouraged invention across a number of areas. The culture we foster in tech, how we think about our work, has direct impact over our ability to innovate and solve problems. And this includes DevOps. The SDLC is a remnant, um, an artifact of a previous era, one in which security was a physical concern and women were still called computers. I think we should throw the SDLC away or more accurately, replace it. Replace it with something that better reflects the nature of our work a linear single threaded model designed for the manufacture of material goods cannot possibly capture the distributed complexity of modern socio-technical systems. It just can't. And these two ideas aren't mutually exclusive that the SDLC was industry changing, valuable and extraordinarily impactful and that it's time for something new. I believe we are strong enough to hold those two ideas at the same time, showing respect for the past while envisioning the future. We talk a lot about abstractions as engineers. Now, what we usually mean is obfuscating logic or creating a separation of concerns, removing overhead from an engineer. And this is because computer scientists have long used the term to mean removing certain details in order to focus on broader concepts. Especially over the last few years with the surge of cloud adoption, abstraction has become one of these tech buzzwords that we use ad nauseum, but never really clearly define. But an abstraction in its truest sense is an idea a notion, a theory. And that idea is almost always expressed visually as a model. Yet, even as abstraction feels somewhat technical, the word model feels as if it belongs to the domain of thought leaders, shouting from their proverbial ivory towers on Twitter. I believe modern problems deserve modern solutions. And we're not going to get very far if we keep attempting to adhere exponential complexity to static models. 
we've been so consumed with technical challenges that we've forgotten to think about how we think about tech. An infinity symbol is widely used to visualize the DevOps tool chain. It was a way of more or less bending the SDLC into a loop through which companies could iterate. And like the SDLC, it implies a linear flow. As in, will you plan and then create or develop and then verify or test, package and build on and on and on, step by step. The DevOps interpretation of the SDLC does not allow for a pause, a pivot, a loop back as required. Now, I don't know about you, I have never had a software project go smoothly in one take, no matter how small, even if I'm the only person working on it. Software development is chaos. It's a study in entropy, and it's not getting more simple. The model with which we think and talk about software development must capture the multi-threaded, non-sequential nature of our work. It should embody the roles engineers take on and the considerations they encounter along the way. It should build on the foundations of agile and DevOps and represent the iterative nature of continuous innovation. Now, when I was thinking about this, I was inspired by ideas like extreme programming and the spiral model. I wanted something that would have layers, threads even, a way of visually representing multiple processes happening in parallel. What I settled on was the revolution model. I believe the visualization of revolution is capable of capturing the pivotal moments of any software scenario. And I'll show you how in a little bit. I'm going to dive into all the discrete elements, but I wanna give you just a moment to have a first impression to absorb my idea independently. I call it revolution because, well, for one, it revolves. Its circular shape reflects the continuous and iterative nature of our work, but also because it is revolutionary. I am challenging 60 years of language that is embedded into our work. I don't expect Gartner to build a magic quadrant around this tomorrow, but that would be like really cool. <laughs> and so you should call me. My mission in this is really to challenge the status quo, to shake things up a little bit and create a model that I think more accurately reflects the complexity of modern cloud native software development. The revolution model is constructed of five concentric circles describing the critical roles of software development, architecting, automating, developing, automating, deploying, and operating. Intersecting each loop are six spokes that describe the production considerations every engineer must consider throughout any engineering work. Testability, securability, reliability, observability, flexibility, and scalability. The considerations listed are not all encompassing. They're not really supposed to be. There are, of course, things that are not explicitly included. I figured if I attempted to think about every single thing you consider through your work, there would be a lot of spokes and we would feel overwhelmed. You might also be wondering why operating is smaller than architecting. Is it less important? Definitely not. When I was first designing this model, I looked at architecture for inspiration. The Guggenheim is one of those shapes that caught my attention with its stunning circular ramp, many of which are probably familiar. In a perfect world, this would be a three-dimensional model. It should show layers, almost like stories in a building. But any model, I believe, must maintain its meaning, even in two-dimensional visualizations. And thus, one of the roles had to be smallest and one of them largest. 
I chose operating to be the innermost part because it represents that process for me. When we're architecting, we're thinking abstractly, we're dreaming, we're designing. As we move through the software delivery life cycle, we become more embedded in the system. And I believe that is represented. So let's dive deeper into each element. We have long used personas as a default way to divide audiences and tailor messages to group people. Every company in the world right now is repeating the mantra of developers, developers, developers. But personas have always bugged me a bit. They tend to be an approach that typically either oversimplifies someone's career or needlessly complicates it. Few people fit cleanly and completely into persona-based buckets like developers and operations anymore. The lines have gotten fuzzy. On the other hand, I don't think we need to tailor messages so specifically to call out the minute differences between roles like a DevOps engineer versus a release engineer. Perhaps most critically, I believe personas are immutable. A persona is wholly dependent on how someone identifies themselves. It's intrinsic, not extrinsic. Their titles may change, their jobs may differ, but they're probably still selecting that same persona in the dropdown of any event they ever register for. <laughs> I was a developer. I will always identify as a developer, despite doing a ton of work in other areas. In my heart, that's how I think about problems. It's the perspective with which I see things first. It, it influences my thinking, my approach. Roles are very different. Roles are temporary, inconsistent, constantly fluctuating. If I were an actress, the parts I played would be varied and lengthy, but the persona I would identify as would remain an actor, an artist. Your work isn't confined to a single set of skills. It may have been a decade ago, but not today. No way. In any given week or sprint, you may play the role of an architect, thinking about how to design a feature or service, a developer, building out code or fixing a bug, an automation engineer, looking at how to improve the manual processes that we often refer to as toil, a release engineer, deploying code to different environments or releasing it to customers, or an operations engineer, ensuring applications function in consistent expected ways. No matter what role we play, we have to consider a number of issues. The first is testability. All software systems require testing to assure architects that designs work, developers that code works, operators that infrastructure is running as expected, and engineers of all disciplines that code changes won't bring down the entire system. Testing in its many forms is what enables systems to be durable and have longevity. It's what reassures engineers that changes won't impact current functionality. And a system without tests is a disaster waiting to happen, which is why testability is first among equals in this particular roundtable. Security is everyone's responsibility, but few, including myself, understand how to design and execute truly secure systems. I struggle with this. Security incidents, for the most part, tend to be high impact, low probability events. The really big disasters, the ones that end up on the news and get us free credit reporting for a year, um, they don't happen super frequently, thank God. Um, you know that there are endless vulnerabilities lurking in our systems waiting to fall over. <laughs> Security is something we know we should dedicate time to but don't often make time for. And let's be honest, it's hard and complicated and kind of scary. DevSecOps, the first derivative of DevOps, asked engineers to move security left. 
the approach meant that security was a consideration early in the process, not something that would block a release at the last moment. This is also the consideration under which I'm putting compliance and governance. While not perfectly aligned, I just figure all the things you have to call a lawyer for should live together. Okay, not really. <laughs> but in all seriousness, the three concepts are really about risk management. Identity, data, authorization, there's a lot of ways to think about it. But the question is who has access to what, when, and how? And that is everyone's responsibility at every stage. Site reliability or SRE is a discipline, a job, an approach for good reason. It is absolutely critical that applications and services work as expected most of the time. That said, availability is often mistakenly treated as a synonym for reliability, but it's not. It's a single aspect of the concept. If a system is available, but customer data is inaccurate or out of sync, the system is not reliable. Reliability has five key components, availability, latency, throughput, fidelity, and durability. Reliability may be the end result, but it's resiliency for me that is the journey, the action, the thing that engineers can actually improve to actually improve then reliability. Observability is simply the ability to have insight into an application or system. It's the combination of telemetry, monitoring, alerting, all of it available to engineers and hopefully leadership. There's an aspect of observability that does overlap with reliability, but the purpose of observability isn't just to maintain a reliable system, though of course that is important. It is the capacity for engineers working on a system to have visibility into the inner workings of that system. The concept of observability originates in linear dynamic systems and is defined as how well an internal, how well the internal states of a system can be understood based on information about its external outputs. It's critical when companies move to the cloud or utilize managed services that they don't lose visibility and confidence in their systems. The shared responsibility model of cloud storage, compute, and managed services require that engineering teams be able to quickly be alerted to identify and remediate issues as they arise. Flexible systems are capable of adapting to meet the ever-changing needs of the customer and market segment. Flexible code bases absorb new code smoothly, embody a clean separation of concerns, are partitioned into small components or classes, and are architected to enable the now as well as the next. And flexible systems, chain dependencies are reduced or eliminated. Database schemas accommodate change well. Components communicate via a hopefully standardized and well-documented API. The only thing constant in our work is change. And in every role that we play, creating flexible solutions that adapt as the application grows is critical. Finally, scalability. Scalability refers to more than a system's ability to scale for additional load. It implies growth a system's ability to mature and flourish over time. Scalability in the revolution model carries the continuous innovation of a team and the byproducts of that growth. And for me, scalability is the most human of the considerations. It requires each of us to consider everyone around us, our customers who use the system and rely on its services, our colleagues, current and future, with whom we collaborate, even our future selves. Software development it isn't a straight line, nor is it a perfect loop. It is an ever-changing, complex dance. 
there are twirls and pivots and difficult spins forward and backward. Engineers move in parallel, creating, I believe, truly magnificent pieces of art. The issue is those moments of pure magic and artistry, the moments when we are our best, most put together selves are fleeting. The prima ballerina falls in practice, sometimes during the show too. The first chair at violinist, a literal concert master plays the wrong note. Your tests don't pass, your code doesn't compile. Your work silently errors, it fails in production. You don't make that deadline, the PMs are mad. It's chaos and it's not you, it's the computer. <laughs> Here's why I think everyone gets mad and everyone gets stressed. We expect, stunningly, that software development should be a straight line. But it never is. <laughs> Life isn't a straight line. Why would machines be? It's like the progress bar on our favorite internet service provider. The one they give us during outages. It says you'll have streaming back in eight minutes and then three hours and then two minutes and then two days. <laughs> we continue to measure progress in a straight line. Product launches are discussed as red, yellow, and green. Now, I appreciate the Toyota production system and how much it's discussed in DevOps circles, but we are not making cars. This isn't a checklist, and once you attach the driver's side door, it's just always there. In no production line does attaching the door cause the catalytic converter to break, but your small change, that little thing, can bring down the whole system or slow down requests in an entirely different, a decoupled service. I am passionate about this new model and approach because I believe it will help developers in their everyday work. Because how can we teach business leaders and product owners and scrum masters that prediction and feature delivery is a bit of a fool's errand when the model we use is still a straight line? Now, I don't expect this model to look exactly like it does now in six months. In fact, I would consider that a failure. I want your opinions and experiences to shape this. I am one person. But let's look at how revolution could look in practice. Think about developing a small feature and all the edge cases you have to consider along the way. Ahmed, a developer, is implementing a new signup form. Easy peasy, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's utilizing a front-end library for the form, developing a service, and using the user class to validate inputs. He uses TDD, or test-driven development, and writes tests first to ensure that the code he will write will meet expected behavior. He then writes that code and verifies it works by running the unit tests. Ahmed was fast, super fast. And within two days, he had created a form and logic that allows users to sign up with a first name, a last name, an email, and a date of birth. He compiled the code and kicked off the build process. A DevOps engineer released the code to production after security and end-to-end -end tests passed. After Ahmed's form was released, a user named Li Huiying opened a support ticket. Hui Ling received an error every time they attempted to register an account. Amy was assigned a ticket in JIRA to fix the bug and presumably update field requirements. Amy changed the requirements to accept dashes and single character names, things that are common in global communities. Amy realized that the overlapping logic could be merged into one form verification method in a helper class, an improvement not related to the bug, but certainly to help the scalability and durability of the system. Amy documented that change for future developers, as I'm sure you always document your changes. <laughs> she 
fixed, ship the fix. There are actually countless other examples. Imagine in a post-incident review during which your team is trying to figure out what went wrong and what went right, everything in between. Let's say Mike was primary on call, but poor Mike had just had a baby and exhausted, slept through the alarm. Jose, a developer, woke up and after stumbling to the computer, read through the alert and opened the monitoring tooling. He quickly realized that the database was throwing hundreds of exceptions. <laughs> Initially, Jose assumed something had been configured incorrectly. It must have been a provisioning issue. He continued to dig into the issue while asking others to help. Jose was able to access a graph that showed a spike in database activity and compared that to changes in the application made around the same time. Aha! Just kidding. It's never that easy, is it? But it would be really cool if it was. <laughs> Here's the clue. Every recent database transaction shared the same article ID. Turns out the comments on an article exceeded the limits originally provisioned for DynamoDB. The immediate fix was to set the limit impossibly high in the middle of the night until morning when the operations engineers could properly enable auto scaling. During the post-incident review, a few developers involved noted that there were no uniqueness constraints stored in the database. Development time was allocated during the next sprint to allow for duplicate rights. This map, this revolutionary model gives internal and external stakeholders, including customer facing non-technical colleagues, the necessary context to understand any given process. It's even more powerful when you're attempting to explain delays, incidents, and complex setbacks. You have something to show. I believe the next 10 years of tech will be focused on developer experience. How do we make development better, faster, but also more enjoyable? How do service providers abstract complexity without exaggerating simplicity or obfuscating observability? And how do we innovate, not just in our technology, but how we model it as well? I can't wait to hear what you think of this new model, this idea and approach to software delivery, this replacement of the SDLC. I'm excited to see how it changes and adapts to all the scenarios we face in software development and how engineers in every role and at every organization tailor it to meet their specific constraints and challenges. Thank you so much for your time and for honoring me in this. Thank you.